Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to the event, our last event for Eco Iowa City. Rowan Jacobson reading from American Terroir, and if I'm pronouncing Terroir wrong, too bad. It's the way I'm going to pronounce it. This is the last public event for Eco Iowa City, a sweet yet bittersweet time for me. Eco Iowa City has been 18, an 18 month long adventure for the Iowa City Public Library and the Iowa City Department of Public Works, specifically the landfill and even more specifically, the recycling division. Two entities received, these two entities, entities received a grant from the ICMA, the International City County Management Association, funded by the Gates Foundation. We were one of nine libraries and city county partnerships chosen from over 515, so yay for us. Um, <clears throat> Jen Jordan, the City of Iowa City Recycling Coordinator, and I have had a grand time in planning programming and events to support sustainability in our community. But more importantly than the marvelous time Jen and I have had, these two institutions have forged partnerships with over 45 entities ranging from environmental groups to schools to city, county, and state agencies. Our penultimate, second to last, I'd love to say that word, thank you, um, event was yesterday where we had a pharmaceutical collection and it was our second pharmaceutical collection and we collected used and expired drugs that um, people had been saving for years. In fact, the first time we did it, we had a, a vial of pills that came from 1982. So our goal was to get the, the drugs out of the water stream and out of the hands of children or other people, and we were very, very successful. And it, it, it makes me happy because that will be a legacy of Eco Iowa City. The city of Iowa City and the landfill will continue to do this every September. So there's, there's one thing that will continue on. Another legacy that I think is a, a great example of how successful the grant has been is the gardens that we've helped to start. There's a garden at the Robert E. Lee Recreation Center, which is just down the street, and that's called the Children's Discovery Garden, and it's growing at this time. It will go into the fall and then the winter, but in the spring, watch that garden because it's only going to get bigger and better. And then there are three other gardens that we've helped, um, one at Miller Orchard, which is a neighborhood garden, one at Fair Meadows, which is next to the Grant Wood Elementary School, and then we just gave a check to the Hope United Methodist Church, and they'll have a garden next year, so that garden will grow in the spring of 2011. <clears throat> oh, so enough about us. Let's get on to Rowan Jacobson. I was fortunate enough this morning to spend time with him picking apples at Wilson, Wilson's Orchard, apples which we will taste after this reading, as well as chocolate. Look over there. Um, Rowan today will read today from American Terroir, savoring the flavors of our woods, waters, and fields. Rowan writes about the relationship between food and the environment in a delightful way. He's expanded upon the concept of terroir, originally used to describe wine and the flavor imparted to it by the soil, to all foods. And as he, and he, as you will see, can better read from his work and much more eloquently describe his travels and writing and eating across the globe. I turn the podium to Rowan. Please help me welcome him. And before I sit down, um, he will be signing, after, signing his book afterwards, and we'll have an apple and chocolate tasting. And we're also selling tickets for one of our partners in this event, Field to Family, and the Harvest Dinner tickets will be for sale in the back of the room, and that's a wonderful event if you've never gone. You might want to expand your taste buds with the Harvest Dinner. Rowan. Thanks, Maeve. It's uh, great to be here. And actually, yeah, I was just looking at the, um, the sign for that Harvest Dinner, so do you want to, does somebody want to actually Talk, mention what it is because I'm thinking I, I would be tempted to stay another week just to, to go to this. It's uh, you can work it, uh, five courses with wines, um, entrees from wild walleye wrapped with local bacon to mushroom fricassee or Iowa lamb rack and loin, with, um, all cooked by chefs from Chef's Table, Cher, Vesta, Oasis Falafel, and El Banditos. $40. You know, a heck of a dinner for forty dollars. So that's. Um, I, I was just saying that I'm going to another harvest dinner on Long Island in a couple of weeks. Uh, similar setup, and it's one hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, you know, I'd take advantage of that. Um, and I, I, since um, since Maeve mentioned the um, the pharmaceutical collection, I have to. Uh, when you first emailed me to to come here. Um, I forget the exact wording of your email, but it said something like, 
we're, you're trying to figure out what day, and you said, I'm collecting old pharmaceuticals on Saturday, so if you come on Sunday, we can have a really great time. <laughs> and I, I, I thought, wow, Iowa City, is, uh, they know how to party. Um, but then, and it took me a while to figure out what's going on, but finally did. Anyway, um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, and uh, it did, I got, got right on that plane. Uh, but uh, as Maeve said, we got to go apple picking this morning. So this is my first time in Iowa City, but I, I feel like I've gotten to get a, at least a little, little taste of, of the, the local culture here. And, and that's been a real pleasure. Uh, so I'm just to make sure everyone's in the right place. And could we um, turn down the lights? Does anybody? Uh, Know the best way to go about that? Is that good? How's that look for you, all, for you guys? Good? Okay. I just want to make sure you're all in the right spot. Um, m my book is American Terroir. Um, it's not American Terror. <laughs> so, uh, although um, several, um, when the catalog for my book was first sent to booksellers, several booksellers actually emailed my publisher to say that they were concerned that American Terror might not be an appropriate title for a food book. <laughs> so anyway, if you're looking for American Terror, you're in the wrong room. This is also not American Terrier, <laughs> although three out of uh, four reviews that I've looked at so far, at least some, at one place in the review, managed to flop the I and the O around, so that, and I believe it would be pronounced Terrier. And my son is in... Um, sixth grade, and when his, his, just this week, his teacher asked him what I was you know, working on, and he said, he's, well, he's got a new book called American Terroir, and his teacher said, you mean terrier? And he said, no, terroir, and his, she said, you mean terrier? And that went on for a while. <laughs> anyway, this is not an American terrier, although in retrospect, I've realized there's a lot of money in dog books, and maybe I should have gone that route. <laughs> All right, my book is American Terroir, and terroir is, uh, well, let's, let's get to that pronunciation uh, right away. Maybe you nailed it. If you say it in the true French manner, it sounds like you have a hairball in your throat. And part of the reason I wrote this book is that I think this is a really useful concept for us all. But I wanted to popularize it. And I, it's sort of built in intimidating because it's French and it's hard to say and it comes from the wine world. So I think an important first step is to get rid of all that and pronounce it like, like good Americans do. So I say terroir and, and most people I know say terroir. The, the word itself comes from the same root as terrain or territory or terra firma, the earth. And that's what it's all about. It's about, you know, the taste of the earth would be the literal translation. Some people take it quite literally. <laughs> Some people take it too literally. Um, it's, not, it's not about literally tasting the earth. Um, the, the, uh, the word basically means all the ways that the earth or the soil or the climate or anything else in a particular place on earth influences the ultimate flavor of, of a food or a drink. Um, one of my favorite definitions is from the wine writer Hugh Johnson. And what I like is that he talks about the ecology of a vineyard, and it, it could apply to any farm as well. Just all the factors going on that are going to make that plant or animal come out like it does. And I also like that he mentions the soul of the vigneron, which is the French word for winemaker, because there's always a human factor with, with terroir. It's, you, you always have a farmer or a winemaker or somebody who is basically looking at the conditions he's got, figuring out what works best, and like taking this deal that nature has offered in this one place and using it in the smartest way that he can. So there's, people are always an important part of terroir. The concept does come from the wine world, and it, it started in France. Well, really, the, the ancient Romans, um, they were into terroir. They, they liked certain wines from certain mountains. They knew that place mattered. But it was the French who really popularized the concept. And it kind of started with uh, Champagne, the Champagne growers. As you can see here, Champagne is the northernmost wine region in France by a good bit. And that gave them a couple of problems, really, things they had to deal with. One, way up there, they had this uh, really chalky soil. They had a little topsoil, and then underneath that was just pure chalk all the way down, which drained really well. Uh, it, it, basically, it, it was always stressing the, the, the vines. But even, an even bigger issue they had was climate. And I think probably some of the winemakers in Iowa have to deal with the same, same issues because um, it just got really cold in Champagne, a lot colder than in most of France. 
And what this meant is that what, when they would make the wine in the fall and they'd bring it down to their chalk cellars and the yeast would start to ferment the wine, but then it would get so cold, even down in those cellars, that the yeast would go dormant. And this was back, it, this was in an era when um, champagne was not highly thought of. 1600s, 1700s, it was kind of made fun of by the rest of the uh, wine-growing regions because it was this kind of thin white wine from uh, northern France. And it was especially made fun of for this reason, which was because the, the yeast would go dormant, the fermentation would stop through the winter. Then in spring, they'd send the bottles of wine, they'd bottle it, they'd send it off to Paris, temperatures would warm up, the yeast would wake up, start doing its thing again in the bottle, and you know what happens next. Kablooey. And believe it or not, for hundreds of years, they thought this was a big problem in Champagne. The, uh, the, well, there's this monk whose name is Dom Perignon, who's the famous founder of Champagne, and there's this apocryphal quote that he's supposed to have said, which is that the first time he sipped bubbly champagne, he said, brothers come quick, I'm drinking stars, which is a beautiful quote, but it's completely untrue. He probably said something more like, brothers come quick, we have a disaster on our hands. He spent his entire career trying to get the bubbles out of champagne, <laughs> and everyone made fun of them for it. Then eventually, somebody, you know, people in Paris started to say, you know, well, maybe it's just me, but I kind of like the bubbles. And in a pretty short time, the public opinion did a total 180. Everybody loved the bubbles. They became associated with celebrations. Champagne was a huge hit. And so then all these other winemakers started purposefully making bubbly wines to imitate champagne. And they even called it champagne because that was the word that everyone looked for. So the champagne growers said, no, 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 no. You can't call it champagne unless it comes from this region, northern France, because this place is different. It's the climate, it's the grapes we use, it's the chalky soil. It's got to be that whole picture to be champagne. And they lobbied the French government, and the French government said, you're absolutely right, and prevented anyone else from using that name. That was the first case of, legally, a, a, a product being associated with a particular place. And they were right. It was distinct because of the place it came from. If it hadn't, if it had come from somewhere else, it would not have had those same characteristics. So then all these other wine growers in France also uh, got on board and said, well, our wine is unique because of these conditions. And they really started to play around with that. And now we have this whole system of wines throughout France and throughout Europe that are all place-based. That's what you see on the label is the name of the place. And it's not just wines. Cheeses are also very closely associated with place. One of the most famous ones is Roquefort from southern France. It's a, a blue vein cheese. And the, the mold, the penicillin mold that makes that blue veins, which is what gives the flavor to the cheese, is found in certain caves in southern France around this city, this town called Roquefort. And the, uh, the story that goes with Roquefort is that there was way back whenever there was this um, young shepherd who was tending to his flock, eating his bland, boring sheep cheese and uh, by, by this cave entrance. And he was sitting there, and then suddenly some French lass like, capered by. And he set down his cheese in the cave, went off after the lass, and totally forgot about the cheese. Then he came back three months later, and lo and behold, it had these blue veins all through it, and it tasted really good. Uh, so whether or not that tr story is true, the part that is true is that it's the mold that makes that cheese taste good. And now that mold has been you know, copied and is used to make cheeses all over the world. But you can't call it Roquefort unless your cheese spends about a year of its life inside those caves in southern France, because that's where the mold comes from, and that's what makes the cheese unique. So yeah, so place. It's all, place is making foods different. In the US, not so much. <laughs> if, if you're making spam, the last thing you want anyone to think about is terroir, right? <laughs> you want to be, be able to draw on pigs from all over the place. In fact, you don't really want anyone to even think about pig when they're eating spam. So it, this has never been a big concept in the US. And even wines, until recently, your typical American wine 
would you know, say something like Burgundy on it or Chablis. It, they didn't want you to think about where they were growing the grapes. For whatever reason, American food and wine producers kind of had this sort of inferiority complex toward Europe, which is why the word imported was a good word for so long. So they, yeah, they, they wanted you to think about some place in France, not them. Now it's changing, as, as I think a lot of people in this room know, and it's changing incredibly quickly. The, the local war movement has spread everywhere in the country with amazing speed. And uh, if you get a chance to look at the table back in the corner, you can see that it's, I'm, I'm really impressed. It seems like it's a really strong force here in Iowa City. In fact, I mean, this, this poster is from Alaska, right? And if, if Alaska can promote its local vegetables, then anybody can do it, right? But I, and I think this is a really great trend, which is why I um, wrote my book, because paying attention to local foods is good for all kinds of reasons. And w there's, it's one thing to do it because you feel like it's the right thing to do, but we'll only do that for so long. People, they'll eat with their heads for a little while, but ultimately they want to eat with their palates. And I think there's a really good argument to be made that it's really fun and really interesting to note the taste differences in foods based on where they come from. So in my book, I tried to pick case studies that were kind of extreme, that really uh, were really obvious where the place was the factor that made the difference. And I'll, I'll explain a few of those. Uh, one is oysters. For me, oysters are, are a great one to talk about because they, they're the only, only food in the United States I, that I really know of that has always been named for the places they come from. If you think about the famous oysters, Malpex, uh, Wellfleet's, Blue Points, Apalachicola, those are all the names of bays where those oysters come from. And it was because way back people noticed that each of those bays produced an oyster with a very consistent and distinct taste. And the reason is because oysters are filter feeders. What they're doing all day long is sitting in their bay with their shells cracked open, about a quarter inch, and just pumping water across their gills. 50 gallons a day for, for these guys. And strain, the gills strain out the, uh, the phytoplankton, the tiny little single-celled plants that they eat. And in doing so, they kind of pick up the flavors of, of that bay. They're, in a way, this is less appetizing, but they're kind of like little pool filters, right? Um, so they have amazingly different flavors depending on where they come from. And uh, one, one reason, one really easy way to think about that is with the salt level. The oysters will have the same level of salt as whatever body of water that they lived in. And here's an example. The Chesapeake Bay, one of the most famous of oyster regions, is it's actually a really long, narrow bay. It's, it's just kind of an expanded river delta. And it only the, comes out to meet the sea right at the bottom tip. And there's all these rivers of Appalachia that feed into it all along the way, feed all this fresh water in. So what this means is that the salinity level of the Chesapeake changes dramatically from its tip until you get down close to the sea. Salinity is measured in parts salt per thousand. So like you can see up near Baltimore, you've got maybe five or seven and a half parts per thousand salt. And the oysters that come from that area, you can't tell that they're salty at all. They taste completely fresh, in, fresh in terms of no salt in them. And they actually taste kind of muddy. They, they taste like the inner harbor of Baltimore, if you've ever you know, walked around there. Not very good oysters. If you get down to the middle, the oysters have about 15 parts per thousand salt, and they're distinctly better. They're saltier and kind of more savory, maybe even a little crisper. Then when you get down here, you get uh, quite salty oysters. And you can't see it on this map, but there's another famous oyster called a Chincoteague salt which comes from Chincoteague Island, you know, like the ponies, which is right outside. It's here in the open Atlantic, and it's got no fresh water feeding into it at all. So the oysters from Chincoteague have the exact same salt level as the Atlantic, which is about 35 parts per thousand. When you eat those, it's almost brutally salty. Like you're, you're looking around for beer right away because uh, it's like, you know, you, when you get hit with a wave at the beach or something, that kind of just salt blast. So anyway, all those, diff that's the, those, all those oysters begin life the same and change because of where they're growing up. 
the, here's the dark side of terroir. I just, just found this uh, this week while researching the Gulf of Mexico oil spill. They were trying to see how the oysters, there was another oil spill on the Mexican side 30 years ago, and they were looking to see how the oysters had done on that side, and they couldn't find any, and then they finally found uh, one fisherman who knew where to find some, and he still eats them, and he said, yeah, they're, they're fine, but then afterward when you burp, it tastes like oil. So that's, you know, that's terroir. Something has changed in that place, which is giving the oysters a different flavor and a not a good one. All right, here's a much more, more pleasant subject. Uh, cheese is a great way to talk about terroir because there's so many things to talk about. So many different local influences make that cheese what it is. One is just what your land can support. If you think about sheep cheeses and goat cheeses, they tend to come from places like Spain or Greece. And that's not coincidental. It's because that's w those are the only kinds of animals that can survive that kind of arid climate. So you, if you live there, you're going to make a sheep cheese or goat cheese. Here or in Vermont where I live, you're more likely to make a cow, cow cheese because that kind of lush environment is just great for cows. So that immediately is going to change the flavor of your cheese. And then what are those animals eating? The a forage, which can be quite different between valleys and, and mountains, has a lot of subtle effects on the milk and the cheese. Some not so subtle, like famously onions or garlic that cows eat will come through hugely in the cheese or the milk. All right, then once you've got your young cheese, you have to age it in a cave. You don't have to, but the more intensely flavored cheeses are. And the cheese that I write about in the book is a particular one that is aged in, it's, it's called a washed rind cheese. And uh, the, like the, the most famous stinky cheeses of all, the ones that uh, Jean-Paul Sartre referred to as the feet of God, are in the washed rind category. Um, and uh, he wasn't so far off because what you do to get that flavor in your cheese is you, you paint the, uh, uh, like a brine onto the cheese each day, a salty substance, and that encourages the growth of a type of bacteria that likes to colonize moist, salty places. So if you smell your sneakers and you smell the cheese, there's a reason that uh, they smell a little bit similar. It's this uh, two cousin bacteria is very closely related that are colonizing those two places. It doesn't smell so good, but it tastes great. It gives the cheese actually like almost like a prime rib kind of a flavor. Anyway, so this vault is all different types of washed rind cheeses because you don't want, those microbes don't play very well with certain other microbes, so you gotta cheap, keep your other cheeses separate. But those, those, and those microbes are just in the air. Most of the interesting cheeses are made b with either molds or bacteria that are just in the air. And cheesemakers do different things to get those bacteria to thrive on the surface of their cheese. Um, the, this cheese, uh, they, because they want it, the bacteria to just go crazy, it's a really moist cheese. As it ages, it becomes really gooey and would actually not hold together. It would fall apart. So they need something to hold it together. Um, and this farm it was called Jasper Hill Farm. It's gotten somewhat famous for it. Well, they needed, you see these, these black rings around the cheeses? They thought, what can we use locally what do we have on the property here on the farm that, that we can hold those cheeses together with? And they have a lot of spruce trees in this part of Vermont. So they took the inner bark of the spruce trees, and that's what the mold they use, or the form they use to hold the cheese together. So it's functional, but it also imparts kind of like a resiny spruce flavor to the out, outer part of the cheese. So again, all these factors together are making that cheese different than a cheese that would be made anywhere else. There's nothing quite like it. And amazingly, they trained the cows to harvest the spruce bark themselves. I don't know how they did it. All right, totally different example. Salmon. Um, wild, every wild salmon from every different river is physically d different than every other salmon because of the characteristics of that river and will taste different thanks to the river. And it all has to do with salmon's lifestyle. They're born in these gravelly streams um, at the headwaters of rivers. And then they spend about their first year of life in that river. But then after that, they swim out to the sea and live most of the rest of their life out in the sea. But then when it's time for them to spawn, they swim back up their home river 
to those little streams where they were born and they spawn and die there. Uh, what that means is that they have to be able to do that upstream migration, which means they have to be adapted to their river. So a fairly shallow river will have a kind of like a long skinny salmon that, that can navigate and obviously it'll look different and that it'll, its fillets will be different. A really powerful river will have salmon with some pretty intense tail muscles to navigate those rapids. And a salmon that comes from a short river doesn't need that much. Um, when, they be, when they do this upriver journey to spawn, they don't eat during that entire journey. So a salmon from a short river, that's not a big deal. It just takes a couple of days for it to get up to its spawning ground. But a salmon from a long river has to go a long way without eating. And the, the all-stars here are Yukon River king salmon, who swim the entire length of the Yukon River through Alaska and into Canada, 2,000 miles upstream against a powerful current without eating. It takes them about three months of constant swimming. Uh, and in order to do that, they need a tremendous amount of fuel on board when they begin that journey. If you get them at the end, they're nothing but a bag of skin and bones. Everything has been used up in that journey. But if you catch them at the delta, they are like no other salmon on earth, just tremendously fat and full of muscle and salmon oil. And the, the Yupik Eskimo who live in that region, their whole culture is orient, or oriented on these salmon. If you, um, if you like stick a, a knife in them, you know, it, to, to gut them, that just oil starts coming out. It's, it's amazing. Uh, so what the Yupik do is uh, th basically they catch them in the summer and fall and they need to live on them the, through the whole winter. So they fillet them, cut them into strips, and smoke the strips and eat like smoked salmon jerky all winter long. And they really, what they, what they value in it is all that fat because uh, they need the calories to get through the winter. The, the latest part of the, the Yupik culture is that they also load some of those salmon onto DC-10s and ship them to Seattle that day and then the, and sell them in Whole Foods throughout the country. And they're just like no other salmon on earth. The, when you put them on your grill, the fat just bubbles out of them. And actually, it doesn't work so well because they always set your grill on fire, I find, if you try to grill them. But if you baste them in the oven, if you just you slow roast them in the oven at a low temperature, and the fat kind of just bastes the fish and makes it incredibly moist. And it's almost like the foie gras of the sea at the end, just really soft and incredibly intense in flavor. Anyway, so that, that salmon is like no other on Earth because the Yukon River makes it that way. OK, uh, one more example. And uh, this is, I'm, I think I'll, I'll do a quick reading from the book to introduce this one just so you guys can get a feel for the book. But uh, this is about wild edibles and foraging. Crinkle root tastes like peanut and wasabi. Dried redfoot bolete smell of cocoa and cherries. Sweet grass of almond paste and fresh cut hay. Milkweed blossom syrup is like perfume on a fox. Cattail hearts are the love child of cucumber and asparagus. Sea spinach, the robust and meaty green that garden spinach has always wanted to be, is undoubtedly the stuff that fortified Popeye. Dried bee balm petals smell irreducible. I could say they're like oregano, orange peel, and saffron, but I'd be missing the mark. They smell like the first time you walk into your lover's apartment. I knew none of these things until Francois de Bois and Nancy Hinton opened my eyes in the summer of 2009. I was spending the weekend with three friends at a fishing camp on Lake Champlain, and we'd popped up to Montreal for the day. We were looking for the same thing four middle-aged guys away from their wives in a strange and exotic city are always looking for, weird food. We were finding it, too. At the expansive Jean Talon market, we'd worked our way through caribou sausages and spruce beer, bacteria-smeared orange cheeses and tubs of duck fat, when we hit a booth that stopped us cold. It was called A la Table des Jardins Sauvages, and a sign identified its business as Gastronomy Forestière. We'd stumbled into the world of forest gastronomy. Forest gastronomy is a trend you've surely noticed. What self-respecting bistro doesn't have fiddleheads and wild leeks on its spring menu? And what self-respecting eater doesn't long to tango with these wild things? 
but this was more like a full-scale rave. Verdant piles of salsify leaves and sea spinach filled a display counter. Roots of fresh crinkle root lined the top. Bags of dried mushrooms hung from the walls. Belites, morels, black trumpets. There were jars of wild ginger mustard, sweet and sour bolita sauce, and pickled daisy buds. A ramekin of wild herb oil was out front for sampling. Needless to say, they had us from bonjour. We ate a mess of sautéed salsify with the perch that we fished out of Lake Champlain that night. The salsify was sweet and peppery and hinted at the cucumbery flavor of Pacific oysters. I had a new touchstone for all future visits to Montreal. More important, I was eyeing the roadside weeds that whipped past our car on the trip home in a whole new way. For I'd learned that the booth was the outlet for a legendary forager named Francois Briard, and that what had been available that day was but a tiny taste of the bounty that appeared over the course of the year, and even that was just a hint of the true possibilities of forest gastronomy, which takes terroir to a new level. We can start to understand a place by paying attention to the ways it influences an agricultural product, like apples or coffee, but we really grasp its essence when we work with the unique suite of wild edibles that call it home, when we truly eat the landscape. It sounded like that's what Francois was up to. To get the full, full Francois experience, though, I'd have to venture to his stronghold, a funky little restaurant in the Quebec countryside. And if any of you get the chance or in Montreal, I highly recommend that restaurant. Here's the, uh, the menu from our days of foraging that we uh, dined on that night. It was, you know, obviously like nothing I'd ever had before because it's not like anything you're going to find unless you go out there and find it yourself or you hire Francois to do it for you. But what struck me is that this was like the essence of a summer day in Quebec. If, if it had, we'd been foraging in the Gulf of Mexico or New Orleans or California, it would have been a whole different meal. So the question is, so? You know, so what? Uh, foods from different places taste different. Does that matter? And I think it does. I'm, it's, uh, I think part of the reason there's, that there's such an interest in local foods now is because we like to have landscapes have an identity. We, like, we want places to have their own identity. And today, like, too many places don't have their identity, right? So I, I sort of feel like local, a focus on local foods and terroir is the uh, antidote to this and this. You know, the, sprawl, that the sort of sense of creeping placelessness that is spreading over too much of America. Uh, the whole reason we travel in the first place is because places are supposed to be different, right? If we go to a different place, we'll experience a, a different type of life there. And uh, if, um, if food can be a big part of that, I think t that's very important to people. People want to have that connection to the landscape, that sense of meaning that comes from the place itself. And I'm just I'm going to end with a little uh, a few secrets about the the wine industry. Wine has promoted this more than any other industry. Like if you read the back label of a wine, it says something like, "We believe that wine is made in the vineyard." Right? It's the sun, it's the soil, and the grapes. It's this very bucolic image, but the reality is is quite different. And uh, I've I've blocked out the the names here to protect the guilty, but you probably know what I'm talking about. The, uh, the critter wines of the world in particular are, are made in a very different way than you th we think of wine being made. We think, you know, they take grapes, Lucy comes and steps on the grapes, turns it, and it turns into wine, and they put it in a bottle. Most, very few places actually source their own grapes at all. They actually grow their own grapes at all. They just source them on the market because it's much cheaper that way. And they're usually not very good grapes, and they usually have way too much sugar in them if they come from really sunny, hot places like California or Australia. So what they need to do then is they need to get a, all that sugar turns into alcohol. So they need to get a lot of the alcohol out of the wine. And this is how 50% of the wines in the world are made, and most of the affordable ones. They take that wine and put it through a reverse osmosis machine. All the solids, the sludge, goes to one side, and all the water and alcohol goes to the other. And then they cook off that alcohol until they get it down to the level they want, and then they remix it with the solids. 
Usually at that point, it still doesn't taste quite right for obvious reasons. So they, um, then they start doctoring it up to uh, hit that flavor profile that most people want, which means they add acids to it. They add powdered tannins to it to give it that kind of sandpapery feeling on the, on the tongue. And they add other stuff to it. Uh, oak chips are a big one that goes in there because uh, vanilla is, there's a vanilla compound in oak chips and that leaches out into the wine to give it that kind of smooth, round vanilla flavor in the background. So they just dump oak chips and then they take those out, obviously. <laughs> anyway, so wine is not regulated by the FDA. It's part of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms in terms of regulations. So they don't need to list their ingredients on the label. If they did, this is what your typical wine ingredient list would look like. Needless to say, the wine industry does not think it would be a very good idea to require, require labeling, although there are a few crazy winemakers who are now uh, doing so. This is one of them, a guy named Randall Graham, who has a, a winery called Bonnie Dune. He, got, he, he was kind of like the first guy to do crazy labels on wine. Cardinal's Inn was one of, one of his early efforts. And uh, he kind of had this conversion experience where after making a lot of money by selling wine through the crazy label rather than through the wine itself, he, he, you know, hit, he basically had his midlife crisis and decided he didn't want to like, make tricky wines anymore. So he, he, decided, he, he sold all of his famous brands like Pacific Rim and uh, Big House Red, Big House White, and basically is spending all his fortune on making wines that he calls vin de terroir, right, wines of terroir. And, and here's a quote of his that I liked. And uh, it's really like n zero intervention winemaking. You, it's beyond organic, it's this thing called biodynamic, where you don't irrigate, you don't tinker with it at all. Basically, it's like we think wine is made, where you grow grapes, you pick a site where you think grapes will do something interesting. You let the wild yeasts do their thing, and you see what happens. And I actually think he's going to lose his whole fortune, because I'm not sure America's really ready for these, but it's an admirable effort. And I think the wines are really interesting. But so here's like, and the idea is that if you, if we can control what a wine tastes like, then we're going to make it taste like what we already like, what we know we like. And it's not going to be, there's going to be no surprises there for us. It's not going to tell us anything we don't already know. It's, you know, it's just like barbecue sauce. It's there, it's good, it's dependable. But he believes that, you know, wine can do more. And, and the idea is that once you, like, get out of the way, then you can let nature sort of take its course and these patterns of existence can come through in the taste of the food and, and maybe do something surprising that nature does that we never would have thought of. And maybe that we look, like helps us learn something and, and understand a little bit more of, about these patterns and these energies of nature. And I love how he compares it to starfish, polygons, all these like classic forms that form our world. Nature's greatest ideas, you know. And I, this is a, a picture of a vineyard in Washington State, which to me sort of encapsulates that whole idea. Like you, when you see certain, certain beautiful forms or taste certain beautiful forms, you know it. And I'll, I'll end with a quote from Gary Snyder, the poet, which is kind of a much less highfalutin way of talking about the same thing. Uh, I'll, get, I'll go ahead and read it. The presence of this tree signifies a rainfall and a temperature range and will indicate what your agriculture might be, how steep to pitch your roof, what raincoats you'd need. You don't have to know such details to get by in the modern cities of Portland or Bellingham, but if you do know what is taught by the plants and weather, you are in on the gossip and can truly feel more at home. He's not talking about terroir with food, but I think it's the exact same idea, and I love that he talks about it in terms of gossip because I think that it hits it on the head. You know, like, you can live in a town and not be in on the gossip and still, you know, li live a perfectly normal life. But you're missing out on things that you don't even know you're missing out on. If you're in on the gossip, then all of a sudden you have this, you, there's a lot more meaning in certain things that you see that you never otherwise would have, would have known. And I think we can all agree that it's more fun to be in on the gossip. So ultimately that, to me, is, is what it's all about.
And uh, thanks for listening. So do we have questions? Oh, we have questions. Um, I was curious, you were talking about the van de terroir as sort of the guy was going to lose his shirt because, you know, we weren't ready for that yet. And, and so I'm going to go back to the foods and say, are Americans ready for that? Because most of those foods that you talk about are not, are, are pretty perishable, aren't going to transport very well. So we need to eat them locally. So is that something economically that's viable? I mean, do you see that as happening? Or That's an excellent question because I think that's a debate going on among all these, all these people focusing on local foods and, um, and some of these more you know, sort of daring extreme foods where if, if you're going to focus locally, you have to have enough of a, a, a local base to pull it off. And if not, you, like, well, like that cheese that I talked about, without New York City, they'd be dead. Well, which is true for a lot of things in Vermont. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they, there's no way they, they could survive with just a local market. And um, so I, I think that part of the whole locavore movement, part of the reason this whole event's going on is because it, uh, maybe the biggest part of that whole movement, if it's going to be sustainable, is raising awareness and creating that, that energy locally. It's because if it's got to be, it can't just be, you know, an artist making artisanal food. It's got to be economically sustainable or it's just going to be a little flash in the pan. My question was sort of related to that, and it's there's got to be some happy medium. I mean, we can't do everything this way, I mean, as much as it would be nice. And so there's certain foods or, you know, flour. Am I really going to get flour from, uh, you know, my local grower who mills the grain? You know, probably not. But so what are the things, I guess, where is that happy medium? Do you have a sense of what the ideal yeah. country would look like given the restrictions and the practicality, which, again, is sort of related to what she asked? Yeah, and I, I've I've wondered about that too. Um, like, I I don't actually have any problem with the uh, the critter wines going through the reverse osmosis machine. You know, if they taste good, and you know they they cost six bucks instead of fifteen to twenty dollars, I think that's great. Although I just think they should have to come clean about what what they're up to. But um, well, you know, the funny thing is, we all used to be able to afford local food. There was no other option. And somehow, you know, because of all the, all the forces in society pushing the other way, it's gotten to a point where, like, local food is, is a luxury, which is kind of a bizarre concept, but that is indeed where we're at. So, yeah, so how do you get back to that and save your shirt, you know? Um, so many, there, there's so many subsidies that go into, like, the, the large-scale agriculture and the movement of, of, of goods all around the world, that if you take away all of that, I think local actually can be more competitive than we think it can. Right, right. <laughs> right, so it's, yeah, so it's, um, you, you got to sort of like, it's got to be done in incremental steps where you adopt this and this and this, and the more things get adopted, the easier it becomes for local producers too, because it's all, always scale is, is a big issue for the small guys. Do we have more questions? Oh, great. Here's a question. I'm just curious from your own um, personal experience going through this book and ex relating to audiences, if you've encountered very much of that kind of political aspect of ultimately it comes down to funding sources and systemic influences. What has your experience been with that? Um, can you state one more time? But, like, what is your experience? Have you encountered a lot of political... political politicization of that, where ultimately looking at the factors of making it um, available on a broader scale, it is a political problem. Have you encountered very much of that, or what is your experience with that? Yeah. Um, I, have, I, I purposefully did not write like an activist book. I mean, although I, they certainly have my sympathy, but I think the local movement is a, is a strong and important movement. But I didn't, I, 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 what fascinated me was just that it's local food, or Different foods taste great because of where they come from. I just love kind of being like a, you know, a culinary tourist 
right? And understanding places through what they make and why they make make that. So I just wanted to like focus on G. Is this is this is great? This tastes great. Why? And purposefully not get into all the rest of it because then you do you get into you know weird little factions and and people have agendas. My only agenda was that was to appreciate these foods more. Um, but like, well, tell me what you're thinking. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's on the minds of people, people who care about food and quality of food and supporting local and making local economies more sustainable know that they're battling against huge corporations and they're lobbying and the subsidies that go into them. And it is a political discourse. So yeah. I'm just wondering how much of that has creeped into what your experience has been with that or where you said it's an incremental kind of thing where you just kind of make steps in one direction and kind of work right. on balancing it out ultimately but yeah i mean it's it's kind of about like the, the you know choice like where you choose to spend your food dollars because you can actually go local and um not and not spend that much more if you're not buying like the pack the packaged foods and 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 those things which are convenient but you know, and you end up spending more on those than if you're starting with the raw ingredients. But then it becomes a time issue. And that's the other part of it is, do people have time to really deal with whole foods all the time? Not that you have to do it all the time. Yeah, I like, I like what you just said. Now, because you're talking about the individual agency and the, the individual, and I think the identity that you pointed out is, is really significant too, the, the local identity of the foods. But I, I, what's your thought on our own individual identity? Because having been a working mom, raising kids, and the convenience of the packaged, and then the cost at New Pie, you know, compared to whatever. But then an identity developed in my household of being the gardener, of eating out of our backyard. So what's your thought about the individual identity and how people play into this? Oh, absolutely. That Yeah, um, if you're actually creating your, the food yourself, like helping to, to bring it into existence, you're going to be really tuned in to how it tastes and possibly why it tastes like that. Because you've been there all along the way. Just like, you know, with your kids, you're pretty aware of, like, you know, what's going on with them because you've been watching closely and you're invested in it. So, yeah, that, that ultimately, you want to talk terroir. It's your local garden where you, you which you know better than, any other food? Go ahead. Into, the, the other thing I find, having gathered from the wild and, and from the woods, like take morels, for example, the identity issue there, how people don't identify with morels, I mean, oh my God, you know, that hasn't been processed. That ha it's just extraordinary to me, that side of it as well. Yeah, there are a few faces that hit people nodding. So how does, you know, what's your thought on that? Because getting into the wild and into the natural setting, just beyond the garden, too. Well, yeah, you know, we, we had that experience today at uh, Wilson's Orchard that um, Paul Rash was telling us how he's growing uh, quite a few varieties of apples there that, you know, are not super consumer friendly at first glance. They're, they look like real apples. They've got splotches on them. They're, they're not perfect. And we've all been trained to become very used to the super shiny, glossy red apple in the store. Uh, so yeah, that, that's a big adjustment. But we're you know we're the first or second generation to to have been used to that. It's uh, we we sort of feel like that's the norm. But it's you know in the ten thousand years of agriculture, it's kind of a an aberration. How long will it last? Who knows? Do you have a question? No. Do you have more quick? Oh. Um, how important do you think the role of uh, local farmers markets are in spreading this idea around with the, the, the people in America versus, um, say, for example, you're talking about the salmon going to Whole Foods or something like that. There's an example where we could have terroir that's exploited and maybe wind up using up all that salmon. So um, do you think there's a happy medium leaning more towards local farmers markets versus these larger chains? Um, Farmers markets, yeah, are obviously huge. The first thing I do when I go to, uh, or the first thing I want to do when I visit a new place is go to the farmers market because I feel like that's where I'm really going to get a sense of 
of that area in a lot of ways. You know, what are people growing here? Why? What? What? You know, what? What does it taste like? And also, I get to you know meet them face to face. So to me, that's like the best tourism you can ever do anywhere is go to the farmers market because that's where the identity really is. Um, but yeah, well, terroir and local they get conflated a lot, but. Um, for me, you know, my interest was in really in like landscapes and, and I was just fascinated by how they actually can make foods different. So it doesn't have to be a local thing. Like, you know, when I get a Yukon salmon in Vermont, I'm thrilled about it and I'm, I'm in my head, I'm kind of there in the Yukon, but that's the beauty of it. I don't need to be in the Yukon. Um, but, uh, and, and wines, you know, I'm fascinated by, to tour through the world of wines. But yeah, I do think farmers markets are, uh, are the key to this whole, the whole growth in local foods, obviously. And that, that's, that trend seems to, I, I kind of thought that the recession was, was going to really sort of dampen the farmer's market um, juggernaut, and it, I don't think it did at all. It's a good sign. I haven't actually gotten to the part of your book where you talk about avocados, uh -huh. but that's something that I really enjoy, even though it's not a local food. And it's something, actually, I've noticed that the new Pioneer Food Co-op puts on sale during Hawkeye season because it's shaped like a football. <laughs> but can you please talk about why you chose to write about av avocados? Uh, the this, this subjects I chose, since, since this is a pretty unfamiliar subject, in everything except the wine world, I wanted to pick examples that were glaring, right? It wasn't like necessarily my 12 favorite foods in the world. It was just, I picked out 12 where the influence of place was significant. And so avocados were, uh, was a great one. And so it's kind of like whatever, whenever I learned of a subject and got that information, I just, I would just pursue it. So these 12 are n not the, the end by any means. There's sort of limitless subjects you could talk about this with. But avocados are a great one because, um, well, they evolved in, in Central America and the Mexican uh, volcanic highlands. And it's like that whole strategy, that tree's strategy for making its fruit has everything to do with the area it comes from. You couldn't get away with that anywhere in the uh, upper 48, really. You know, San Diego, that area is the other place. And Florida are the only two places that avocados come from in the continental 48. And the thing with avocados that we love so much is that they have so much fat in them. They're unlike any other fruit. Every other fruit tree I can think of, pretty much, its strategy is to make a fruit with a whole bunch of sugar and seeds in it and attract birds or mammals or whatever who will eat, you know, they want the sugar and they inadvertently spread the seeds around and you get new, new plants. An avocado makes no sugar at all for whatever reason it decided to make fat like a little like butter bomb uh, and it's really like in terms of calories fat is really expensive to make it's really easy to make sugar sugar is always cheap calories you know whether you're a, a fruit tree or a baker like the easiest thing to do is just dump sugar into it but fat is a much more complex molecule um, takes a lot more resources to make make fat so the avocado tree you know, make and you know, an avocado is a big fruit, relatively full of calories. Uh, really, like you know, that's a major score. That's like treasure for anything that can deal with it. But it's big. It's got a gigantic pit in the middle. Um, it evolved to appeal to these like gigantic tree sloths called gomphotheres and these other huge mammals that lived down in that area a few million years ago that could eat the whole, the, you know, the fruit whole and transport those seeds around. Because it's, it's pointless for the avocado to go to all that work unless it's getting those seeds spread around. And the only things that could do it were really big animals. So basically, it, it like made the, like the big score, right? And it's appealing to you know, high-rolling consumers who can afford to, to deal with that big score. And the, anyway, the only way the avocado can do that is it's in that tropical setting where those, you know, we... we won't, those of us from northern climes think of fruit as a part-time thing. It's, it comes in the fall, right? And then you got winter to deal with, so the trees have to go go dormant. But in the tropics, they don't they don't have any kind of seasonal orientation 
they just the, the fruits on the tree year round. So those really good avocados have to be on the tree for about 18 months, slowly getting fatter and fatter. And you can only do that down there. And they need a lot of water, huge amounts of water, which is why the avocado industry in California is in real trouble because they need to irrigate like crazy and they can't really do that anymore. In Mexico, they get storms off the Pacific. They have more water than they know what to deal with. So it's a, a tree well suited for its own land. Hi, the idea of, of terroir is interesting because it's sort of, do you take a short-term or a long-term view? So if we take a short-term view, we can see the increasing cost of fossil fuel is going to make shipping products from Florida and California, never mind Chile and New Zealand, like totally unrealistic. So it's going to be a command performance. Whether we can make it tasty and attractive, that's our challenge. But when we look at something like, say, the, the chili pepper, well, or even the coffee bean, you know, these were things which sort of burst on the scene. And although we don't grow coffee, every, every place around the equator has sort of taken up the pepper, the hot pepper. And so now the pepper has made its way to, say, the different Asian countries, and they each in their, their in climate and their peoples and their culinary preferences have sort of made their pepper their own over, I don't know how many years it's been, but I mean, so it's sort of this big mixing. And if we think in Iowa, what in Iowa, the humans that used to live here grew corn and squash and beans, you know, well, what varieties do they grow? I mean, obviously, we're still growing corn and beans, so that's something, but we've lost the, you know, so I mean, sort of, it's just, it's just a, a, a sort of a swirling around that's sort of scary because it seems like you could lose your true identity and have just massive crops of GMO corn and beans, uh, yet still have the freedom, like seeing how all these things influence, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of fascinating, and, and I puzzle here in the Midwest, you know, what is our true terroir? Yeah, and I, um, I was actually going to, I'm hoping to turn this over to you guys and, and hear about any, you know, suggestions of things, things from this area that you feel like are, the, the ones that come from here are better than the ones that come from anywhere else. Uh, so today I brought as a treat some paw paws. Ah. So you probably heard about paw paws when you're yeah. singing as a child, you know, picking up the toys, pick up the paw paws, put them in the basket. And I thought like a, I thought a paw paw was something like a, just short of a unicorn or a leprechaun or a, maybe a morel, <laughs> you know. Anyway, I had my first paw paw, and now I'm happy to say there's paw paws growing in Iowa City, and wow. we've got some today to sample. <laughs> cool, that's great. I guess we should all, the, um, the apples here we, all, we picked today and um, a variety of apples, I think it's all written down, but uh, uh, the guy at Wilson Orchards was telling us that there's, he has certain varieties that taste terrible in the places where they're developed and in Iowa they taste great because of the soil and the climate. It's just like a good match somehow. And then I've also brought um, chocolate, this is the chocolate that I write about in the book, uh, it's a Mexican style chocolate, which is made in, with these stone mills, so it's much grainier than the really smooth chocolate that we're used to, which kind of puts people off at first, but if you know it's coming, it's better. Um, and because the particles are bigger, though, it kind of holds more flavor inside, so as you eat it and sort of let it melt in your mouth, it's, there's a lot of flavor that comes off of it. So I thought it might be fun for you guys to try that. And there's two different bowls there, Sa exact same... Uh, recipe for making the chocolate, but one is from Chiapas, Mexico, a really old style variety that the Maya used to use, and one is from the Dominican Republic, a more modern cultivar. So you can taste those, those dip, two different ones, and, and it's just kind of fun to note the differences, which are significant. Well, we've come to the end of our hour, so I'm going to wrap it up now and invite everyone to have a sampling of apples pawpaws. Who knew we were going to have pawpaws? Yeah. And the two different kinds of chocolates. And if you'd like to purchase a book, Prairie Lights is selling them in the, the lobby, and Rowan would be glad to, to sign your book. But thank you very much. This was incredibly informative and fun, too. Thank you.